Thanks, Dennis. Um, thanks for that spectacularly succinct summary of why we're here tonight, what we're going to focus on, and also gesturing towards possible strategies and solutions that we could be looking towards um, in the course of the next hour and a half. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next piece, Gay Mason, um, it's an opportunity for those of you who know less about the society and some of us who are in the society as well to sort of picture the historical and the um, almost the political context for this work. Rosalie Rondeau, who is she, where is she from, how does this connect to the kind of advocacy that we're involved with nowadays, but also a sense of, you know, a long-term history of this commitment. Um, Gay uh, is president of the um, St Vincent de Paul Society Wollongong Central Council. She was elected back in February this year. However, her apprenticeship with the society goes back 17 years. Um, she's been a volunteer, a centre president, a conference president, and is very passionate about the society and its works. She's also had an extensive uh, professional background in the private sector. Gay, come and tell us about Rosalie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. The year is 1786. During that year, Abraham Baldwin was selected as president of the University of Georgia. Charles Cornwallis was appointed governor of India. Commercially made ice cream was advertised for the first time. Tragically, a landslide dam caused by an earthquake collapses, killing 100,000 people in the Sichuan province in China. And a baby girl is born to simple mountain parents. She was named Jean Marie Rondeau, better known to us as Blessed Rosalie Rondeau. The incidents mentioned are long forgotten except in history books, but not Rosalie. Rosalie will always be remembered by Vincentians around the world and always in our prayers. They say we are products of our childhood and that could definitely be said of Jean Marie. She was three years old when the revolution broke out and her parents made their home a refuge for the religious who would not take the oath to support civil constitution. Jean Marie grew up surrounded by her faith and social justice. This exceptional environment forged a strong character in Jean Marie, one she found she needed on many occasions, especially when both her much-loved father and baby sister died within three months of each other. She was just 10 years old. Jean Marie assisted her mother in looking after her siblings until she was sent to school with the Ursuline sisters. An intelligent child, Jean Marie moved, uh, sorry, an intelligent child, Jean Marie loved to walk and it took no time to discover the daughters of charity who ran a hospital. It seems incredulous that a young child of 12 would want to spend time with the daughters in a hospital and not enjoy her childhood. But these were different times and it was there she gained some experience caring for the sick. At age 16 years, going on 17, Jean Marie joined the Daughters of Charity and was given the name Sister Rosalie. After a short time with the daughters who recognised a delicate constitution, she was sent to the house of the daughters in the Muftard district, where she remained for 54 years. This was an impoverished district, both physiologically and spiritually, but one Sister Rosalie called home. When people are passionate about things, it seems great things come from that passion, and so many people benefit. And so each person coming into contact with Sister Rosalie benefited greatly and none less than Blessed Frederick Osenham, who was mentored, inspired and encouraged by Sister Rosalie. While this may sound a little corny, I would have to say Sister Rosalie is one of my heroes. Always dealing with the poor with great respect and consideration, she sought to make life better for our friends in need. Sister Rosalie opened a free clinic, a pharmacy, a school, a child maternal centre, a youth centre, a club for young workers. She also organised sewing and embroidery classes. All this while suffering a delicate constitution 
and very soon a network of charitable services were established to counter poverty and offer some hope for a better life. Just as St Vincent had, Sister Rosalie welcomed the generous donations from the rich that flowed, all because they could not resist this persuasive woman. Today it is us who are blessed to have had this brave, heroic woman who mounted a barricade during the revolution and demanded they stop shooting, shouting out, haven't I enough widows and orphans to care for now? What strength, what courage. Her loved daughters of charity continue today. Her good works which inspired so many, including Frederick and our society, is alive and strong across the world because we are based on love, compassion and social justice. Everything this child, sister and woman stood for. In every diocese across the world and here in Australia, Sister Rosalie is recognised. At every meeting she is mentioned and every time a Vincentian makes a visit to a friend in need, we take her and Frederick with us. I was honoured and excited when asked to introduce this lecture to you and was given a brief to follow. The subject, as you are aware, the changing face of poverty among older women. We live in a throwaway society and sadly, sometimes that means people. Yes, we live in a cleaner society than 200 years ago and yes, medical treatment is easier. Government pensions are available. However, what about the high rents, power bills, the homelessness and those who, for whatever reason, have been discarded? Being a 60-year-old woman on New Start leaves a lot to be desired. Obviously, you will not be able to pay a high rent. And if you can, there is no money left for food and energy bills. A dilemma Vincentians are faced with every day when trying to assist those who come to us as a last resort. Add to that a possible mental illness or addiction and you have a situation none of us would like to find ourselves in. We have come so far and yet the road ahead is so long. My own Central Council members are faced daily with requests they are sometimes unable to meet. As of incension, I have worried about the woman who came to see me who is living in her, living in her car with two dogs and won't leave them. The woman who was once a great hairdresser but who has been discarded by her husband and family because they could no longer handle her bipolar. The older woman who feels great sadness and loyalty to a husband who punches her black and blue but feels proud because she thinks the kids never knew and still don't. Being poor isn't always about money in your purse, but it can be. And it can be about your soul, your confidence, your spirit and so much more. Our visionaries were St Vincent de Paul Blessed Rosalie Rondeau, Blessed Frederick Osenham and St Louise de Marillac. We remember them all. Today's visionaries may not be remembered in the same way. But in the confines of the society, there is a network of members, volunteers and staff working to carry on the much needed work begun by our founders for our friends in need. I leave you with not my words, but those of Blessed Sister Rosalie. What are you doing for humanity, for the poor? Thank you, and I remain your servant. Thank you, Gay, for that wonderful introduction to um, Rosalie. Um, it's now with some privilege that we've got the opportunity to listen to our keynote speaker, um, for the evening, the Honourable Susan Ryan, AO, um, former Age Discrimination Commissioner and Disability Commissioner. Susan was appointed as Disability Commissioner, Age Discrimination Commissioner in 2011 and 2014, served both terms until 28 July 2016. As Australia's first Age Discrimination Commissioner, she was very effective in drawing attention to the extent of discrimination against older people. She commissioned pioneering research into ageism and disability discrimination 
and conducted the first national inquiry into workplace discrimination against older Australians and Australians with a disability. This resulted in the landmark report, Willing to Work, which sets out national strategies to improve economic participation of Australians as they age and for people with disability. Until her appointment as Commissioner, Susan was also Independent Chair of the IAG and NRMA Superannuation Plan, Pro-Chancellor and Council Member at the University of New South Wales, chaired the Australian Human Rights Group in 2008 to 2011 and was the Women's Ambassador for ActionAid Australia. This CV is almost too long, isn't it? <laughs> she was CEO of the, Australian, uh, the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia, President of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees and a founding member of the Australian Council for Superannuation Investors and of the ASX Corporate Governance Council. For those of you slightly older than the audience, I know many of you won't remember this, um, Susan was also a um, senator for the ACT, becoming the first woman to hold a cabinet post in a federal Labor government. I remember it very well as a poster poster girl, really, for progressive politics and for women at the time. You won't remember, you younger folks. Um, for government, she was the Minister for Education and Youth Affairs, Minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women and Special Minister of, of State. Pretty extraordinary accomplishment, particularly in that time. As Education Minister, Susan saw school retention rates double in universities and schools around the country and TAFEs grow significantly. She pioneered extensive anti-discrimination and equal opportunity legislation, including the landmark Sex Discrimination Act 1984 and Affirmative Action in 1986. She was awarded, probably too late now, an AO for her services to the Australian Parliament in 1990 and has had numerous honorary doctorates awarded as well. It's a great privilege to have you here tonight, Susan. Thank you. Well, good evening. Well, I'm a bit ex quite exhausted listening to all that, so I suppose you are too. But look, I must say uh, thank you, Ian, and it's an honour and privilege to be invited to give this Rosalie Rondu annual lecture here, sponsored by that wonderful organisation, the St Vincent de Paul Society. Now, I do start by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora and express my respect for the Elders past and present, and particularly to any Indigenous uh, people who are with us this evening. Well, I've been asked to address the topic of the changing face of poverty, and this is a picture that puts the spotlight on homelessness among older women. Well, just to start, I'd like us to consider how we got into this position. As we move through the second decade of the 21st century, we face many challenges produced by the rapid changes human society has experienced over the last generation, even since the millennium. We accommodate, often without much thought, most of the beneficial changes, the dramatic uh, improvements in medical science and practice, the communications revolution brought to us by the internet and uh, information technology, the comforts and conveniences of modern homes. Here in Australia, the cultural and racial diversity of our population increases yearly. New vitality, talents and perspectives uh, contributed uh, by uh, migrants and refugees are in most cases absorbed by us without significant disruption. We've seen progress in our social attitudes so that individuals now have wider choices about their lifestyles. Previously discriminated against minorities, those with disability, those who are LGBTI and Indigenous Australians are accorded more recognition, respect and opportunity now than they got a generation ago. But as well as these improvements, economic and technological change has created new forms of hardship and disadvantage. The dislocations of a globalised economy have destroyed the secure jobs that many enjoyed, especially the blue-collar jobs in manufacturing and lower-skilled white-collar jobs. Once the jobs go, home ownership, community stability, family cohesion and the capacity of individuals to plan for a secure old age go too. Back in the 1970s, uh, thank you Ian, 
when I was beginning my political work, dedicated as so many were then to a progressive agenda of social and economic reform, I believed we would be able to create more opportunities everywhere and greatly reduce inequalities of all kinds. We did want to abolish poverty, not just Bob Hawke, we all wanted that. And these things started to happen. But now, almost half a century later, we actually see increases in inequality among our citizens. Despite years of social and economic reform, instead of the end of poverty we aspired to, we see new kinds of poverty growing at a distressing rate. This observation brings me to uh, our topic this evening, homelessness among older women, the new face of poverty. Now we need to recognise the extent of the problem of poverty among older women and the causes of it so that we can identify effective interventions and attack this form of poverty before it gets beyond us. The extent is already worrying. Demographic change means women are living longer, but because of employment and other gender discrimination, are blocked from earning enough money to support themselves in these longer lives. Women experience employment discrimination at every stage. They earn less, typically are restricted to lower paid jobs, which of course produces lower levels of superannuation. They do not get fair access to training and are blocked from promotion to senior roles. When they have children, they only get minimal financial support for parental leave and then they face barriers when they return to paid work. Typically, it is women who undertake caring roles for elderly parents and family members with disability. And they often need to leave the workforce entirely to provide this care. Most of this caring work, of course, is unpaid or attracts only a small benefit and, of course, no superannuation. As well as workforce inequalities, other changes in social mores over recent times mean that more and more women, as they approach age pension age or are forced into earlier retirement by age discrimination, are single. According to the most recent census, that is the most recent census for which we have results, <laughs> uh, the 211 census, nearly 700,000 women were single over 45 years and had less than median income and did not own their own home. Now think of that, over 700,000 single, over 45 years, lower than median income and without a home. From this data, it's been projected that more than 500,000 women are likely to fall into housing stress over the next two decades. Average life expectancy for women is stretching to 90 and beyond. Good. But women still work fewer years than men, earn less when they are working and therefore save less for retirement. They have poorer chances of getting their own home, especially if they're single. Age discrimination, of course, affects both men and women. Because of ageism and health issues, labour force participation declines sharply with age. In November 2015, just last year, uh, just about 73% of Australia's aged between 55 and 59 were participating in the labour force, compared with just over 56% of those aged between 60 and 64, and just 12% of those aged 65 and over. Now, bear in mind the age pension doesn't start at 65, and of course that's going up to 67 over the next few years. So with a little over of uh, only 12% uh, of over 65s working, how do we imagine the other 87% are supporting themselves? Well, the answer is, and many of you would know this, the answer is with great difficulty. Where individuals reach age pension age and own a home or share a home with a partner, the situation is manageable. The age pension, low as it is, supplemented by access to public health services, various concessions and some super, means that home-earning older people can usually get by. But the problem explodes when older people do not own a home and cannot afford private rents. 
This situation is typical of more and more older women living in our cities and suburbs and also in our regional towns. <coughs> the proportion of Australians reaching age pension age owning a home is in decline. A generation ago, most people, including those who'd worked in low paid jobs, retired with a house. These days, this is less and less the case. Especially those women I've referred to, low income, single, who've often forgone years of even their low earnings to care for family members. These women do not own a house and without paid work, they cannot afford private rents. These women are not supported in these circumstances, either by the market or by public policy. And these are the women who are slipping into homelessness. These are the women who rely on charities to provide them with some sort of accommodation, often temporary and insecure. These are the women who sleep in their cars, if indeed they have a car, or who are forced to move in with family and friends, a situation which is intrinsically short term. What is the size of this group? How many are we talking about? Well, I would say, looking at those uh, 2011 census figures, we are looking at hundreds of thousands of women either in this awful situation or in danger of falling into it. This is the face of poverty in 2016. Now, I must be clear that the fundamental barrier to these women living in a secure and dignified manner is the lack of affordable housing. There are, of course, many other factors, but that is fundamental. And here, when I'm talking about this group of women, women, I'm not particularly focusing on individuals with severe mental illness or significant disability, though, of course, the needs of these people are very great and are not adequately met. The shock, if you like, of this new face of poverty is that most of the women involved have not experienced long-term illness and have worked most of their lives. They may have once owned a home, but lost it through relationship breakdown, domestic violence, business failure, or sheer bad luck. It happens. These women would not be eligible for public housing in New South Wales. Here, the Housing Minister advises, we have a waiting list of about 60,000. Now, most of the people on the waiting list are people with significant problems, and they must be accommodated ahead of our well and capable, but poor older women. Of course, if our 60-year-old newly unemployed low income, but otherwise competent and healthy woman cannot find secure rental accommodation before long, she will develop health and other problems. We need to ask of our governments and of our private sector providers of housing, why is it that when we hear and see evidence continually of a housing boom, where we were when we are told that the construction of dwellings is at an all-time high, that a proportion of these new dwellings cannot be offered at an affordable rate. I'm assured by experts who know much more than I do about uh, local and overseas practice that in parts of Europe, for example, government requires about 20% of new developments to be affordable. Here, we don't do that. Why not? I'm advised, for example, that the massive new development at Barangaroo has only 2.8% available for affordable housing. What stopped the government, remembering that they were giving away public land, what stopped the government from insisting on 20%? What are the obstacles to such a fair and practical policy? Now, I would say not commercial reality. New housing developments of this kind are hugely profitable. If our state government were to require a 20% affordability component, or even a 15%, as St Vincent Paul is advocating, the enterprise would only be marginally less profitable to the private developers. State governments do seem loath to intervene in this way on market forces, yet developers are benefiting from the opportunities created by the sale of what is often public land and public assets. So I'm calling on governments to revise this approach. It would assist them in the business of government to do so. If they don't require a market adaptation to increase the supply of affordable units, 
then their public housing waiting lists will burgeon well beyond the 60,000 it currently stands at. That's state government. So let me turn to the Commonwealth government. Now, the Commonwealth government, of course, pays income support and other benefits to all who, because of unemployment, illness, disability or age, cannot earn an income. It has to be in the interest of the Commonwealth to work with the states to increase the supply of affordable housing. If they do this, their own pension and benefit bills and health costs, including aged care costs, will be reduced. People who are securely housed are, of course, healthier, happier and more able to get paid work. And regarding aged care, the current established policy is for the Commonwealth to pay for care delivered to a person's home. This is what people want and the costs to government of providing care in this way are much lower than the costs of residential aged care. But of course, to receive aged care at home, one must have a home. Now, of course, there are a number of admirable NGOs. There's Miss in Australia, there's St Vincent de Paul, there's uh, Brotherhood of St Lawrence in Victoria, and various excellent housing associations who are doing it, who are demonstrating how to provide, allocate and maintain affordable housing. Their work is wonderful, but they need more public investment so as to be able to do what they're doing on a much larger scale. We do need a concerted advocacy campaign to get local, state and federal cooperation and action. Now, I've been arguing the case, especially when I've been speaking to government ministers and the like, in terms of public budgetary benefits, because these are the arguments that are most likely to have impact on political decision makers. But, of course, we're actually talking about a fundamental human right, the right to secure housing, especially in older age. We know that solutions to the poverty of older women and associated homelessness are available the excellent work of NGOs and organisations like St Vincent de Paul show that and their work should inspire governments. And at the same time, we have among Australian developers, architects and designers, depths of creativity that should be applied to new solutions for homelessness. It is possible to design and build many more of what have been called tiny homes. These are very small but well-designed units with ready access to communal facilities. These dwellings can be built at a much lower cost than conventional units and if they are well located, provide highly suitable and affordable housing, especially for single older people. Some initiatives along these lines have already started, but again, where is the policy drive? Where is the political leadership and the incentives to boost this particular solution? So, in conclusion, I repeat my remarks that first it is crucial to identify the extent of homelessness among older women and the reasons for it. And it is important as we do this to recognise that the disadvantages of poor older women are not things that have just emerged. They're the culmination usually of lifetimes spent experiencing sexism and discrimination, especially in the jobs market. So we need to move to the immediate solutions along the lines I've suggested with governments showing leadership and partnering with developers and NGOs. But at the same time, thinking of the longer term, so that we won't be facing the same or even worse problems in 25 years' time, we do need to continue our efforts to get rid of entrenched workforce and pay inequity for women and coordinate and improve public support for women for their home-based caring role. So in the spirit of the wonderful Rosalie Arondu and recognising the long and important work of the St Vincent de Paul Society to assist the disadvantaged, I call on all of you to become activists in this cause and to sign that petition which we've had uh, launched tonight for the 15% compulsory and make sure everyone you know and a lot of people you don't know sign it too. Thank you. Thank you, Susan.
for that sweeping overview of the field. Um, also, just you know, educating us all about this, the range of trends that are impacting at the moment on this issue. And also a, um, a projection, too, of a way forward that is concrete, practical, policy-oriented that we could pay attention to. In fact, the Tiny Homes was quite a, an exciting piece. There was a launch even a week ago of an initiative in Sydney, which I understand is, you know, attempting to provide exactly those homes and do it really cleverly. Um, some interesting and, and intriguing developments. Um, with that in mind too, a couple of um, short uh, presentations from our panel members so you get to know them a little bit as well. First, uh, Michelle Anderson. Michelle has a passion for working in the homelessness sector, specifically with older women. She has worked at Our Lady of the Way, crisis accommodation in various roles since August 2009 and is currently the caseworker at Our Lady of the Way for on-site clients as well as past clients living in the community. She's involved in a number of community projects and services. She's a board member of the Cumberland Women's um, Health Centre Management Committee and a member of the Parramatta Hol Holroyd Domestic Violence Committee and a member of the Older Women's Housing and Homelessness Group. Um, one of the things that St Vincent's does very well is draw together in a big picture policy advocacy pieces with really direct experience of dealing with clients in the, at the coalface, if that's the right word for it. So we'd love to hear that perspective now. Thank you very much, Michelle. Of the reported nearly 1,800 older women who presented as needing long-term long-term affordable housing between 2011 and 2012, only 11% of them were assisted. That's only 198 women. The society recognised a need for a safe space for older women and in July 1996 started Our Lady of the Way Women's Refuge. To this day, the society still provides 100% of its funding. Our Lady of the Way is the only crisis refuge accommodation service for ladies over the age of 50 in Sydney. A lot of our clients find themselves homeless for the first time in their life. These ladies are mothers with adult children and at times grandmothers. Can you imagine your grandmother walking into a refuge for the first time? Our ladies tell us that they've all seen the movies and heard the stories about how bad refuges are that they are full of drugs, alcohol and violence. So when they walk into a building that instantly gives them a feeling of home, they usually break down. Let me give you an example of some of the reasons why ladies have sought assistance from Our Lady of the Way. A 70 year old lady, she had worked hard all of her life and from doing so was lucky enough to own her own unit. She married late in life and had a son who was her world. Her partner then unexpectedly died, leaving her a widow. Things were hard, but she managed. She had her son. However, in his mid-twenties, he developed OCD and he became very violent towards his mother. He felt that she brought germs into the house. So he made up all these rules about what she could touch, how she could touch it, and at what time she could touch it. Eventually, she was bound to get it wrong. And when she did, Thing turn, things turned badly very quickly. This lady was faced with either leaving her home or sending her son, her only family, to jail. This was something that she couldn't bear. So she sought refuge at Our Lady of the Way while we supported her in accessing medical treatment and supports for her son. A 77-year-old lady who was married for over 50 years her husband had worked hard all of his life and they raised children and grandchildren and lived a very content lifestyle. While on a family holiday, her husband collapsed with a stroke and he never recovered. While he was being cared for, his eldest daughter had his will changed, which left his wife of 50 years with nothing. Her children placed her in the refuge on Christmas Eve while they spent her inheritance. By the time we could assist her with legal advice and going to court, there was very little left. This lady was left heartbroken and five years later is still healing. She tells us every time that we see her, if it wasn't for the St Vincent de Paul Society and Our Lady of the Way, she'd be dead by now. As someone who gets to know these ladies on an individual level, the new rent subsidy initiatives such as Start Safely and the new Rent Start program aren't the answer for older women. 
These private rent initiatives aim to have people spending less time in supported accommodation, but also expect that after a period of time, they will be able to maintain their own needs in the private rental market. I ask you, what do you think happens after the three years of subsidised rent? If these ladies can't afford private rental now, will they be able to in three years? Will finding employment in three years be any easier? In my opinion, placing these women in subsidised rentals for a short period only leaves them wondering what's next. Not knowing what is next impacts every aspect of your life. Can you imagine knowing in the, that in three years you could become homeless? Would you feel empowered? Would you feel motivated to make friends and social connections? If affordable rent is no more than 30% of your income, where in Sydney can you find safe, affordable, permanent housing for less than $200 a week? We are talking about a generation that has worked so hard to make this country what it is. We as the community sector need to come together and find a solution. Let's not let down our older generation when they need us the most. Thank you, Michelle. You look relieved to be back down there. <laughs> well, well done. Um, thanks very much, too, for painting a picture of a, a, you know, an actual face um, to these issues that we've been talking about. Thank you for that. Um, uh, another member of our panel, Catherine McKernan. Catherine joined Homelessness New South Wales as the Chief Executive in February 2015. She has experience in working to prevent and reduce homelessness in, across New South Wales, um, having worked on the Homelessness Action Plan and the National Partnership Agreement on Homelessness. Um, she's also overseen various service delivery models, such as the Staying Home, Leaving Violence and Way to Home, and various models associated with those, those initiatives. She's got experience quite broadly in the NGO sector and in social policy areas such as mental health, preventing violence against women and disability. We're very pleased to have the CEO of Homelessness New South Wales. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, so Homelessness New South Wales has uh, been around for a while and uh, the issue of older women and homelessness has preceded me for a very long time prior to my time as the CEO. Um, but recently, uh, when I joined the organisation, um, we were looking to carry that work on and I guess uh, the, the Housing and Homelessness, Old Women Housing and Homelessness Group, which um, St Vincent de Paul is a member of, and Homelessness New South Wales and various other organisations were feeling a, f a little bit frustrated about talking about the increasing need and the statistics and the issues without really feeling that they were making much difference other than raising the issue. And so about this time last year, we kind of got together and thought about what can we do to really try and bring some concrete action about to really address the issue of old women and homelessness in New South Wales. Um, and so from that came, I'm really pleased to say, a plan for change, which we launched at International Women's Day um, earlier this year. And um, what we did was really build on what Susan and Michelle and others have already spoken about today in terms of the increasing, is increasing need of older women needing uh, housing, the issues around affordability, the issues around uh, the need for economic independence and so on. Um, but rather than talking about the facts and figures, really looking at what we could do that was concrete um, to address the issues. So the plan itself, um, doesn't really, it talks vaguely, it talks generally about those issues, but then it goes to what we'd really like to see change. Um, and it's quite pragmatic. So the, I'm really pleased to see the affordable housing petition being launched today. Um, Homelessness New South Wales has worked really uh, closely with a range of organisations, including St Vincent de Paul, around affordable housing um, over the years. And we had an affordable housing conference that was run with the Federation of Community Housing Providers uh, in July which is really pushing the issue. So I'm really pleased to, to see that that's happening. Um, so uh, it goes without saying, I guess, it's a long-winded way of saying, we're, it goes without saying that affordable housing and addressing the affordable housing issues in, in New South Wales is, is really the number one priority in terms of addressing the issue. Um, the plan that we came up with um, 
it assumes that, I guess. And so what we've also asked for, though, within, within an affordable housing strategy and within any plan to address homelessness, that older women is um, a priority and that there's the New South Wales government actually uh, does some concrete things to address the specific issues that relate to older women. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the New South Wales government is currently uh, undertaking consultation and, and has put out a discussion paper looking to develop a New South Wales homelessness strategy and Homelessness New South Wales will be identifying the issue of older women and homelessness and what needs to happen um, as one of the key things that needs to be included in that strategy. And I would encourage anyone else in the room who's going to make a submission, which they're due next Friday, to you know, make sure that they consider and include older women in, in that as well. Um, the other thing we've done uh, quite practically is to look at uh, the affordable housing issues and look at some of the practical things that we could advice we could provide to government and to community housing providers around what works for uh, older women in housing. And so the, issue, the example of tiny homes was brought up earlier. We've received some funding and we're working with the Sydney Women's Homelessness Alliance um, to look to talk to older women who have been either who are either at risk of homelessness or who have been homeless and talk to them about what would they like in um, in housing if we were able to provide affordable housing and affo affordable housing projects. What would work for them? Like how many people would be viable? Would it be viable to live with? What's essential in terms of um, living arrangements? What kind of communal um, uh, uh, things would you like to have available, you know, for example, gardens or uh, places to have dinner together, that sort of thing. And so we're in the process of talking to a number of uh, older women um, to really hear from them. And as well as that, we're also talking, working with architectural students and architects around how you might then uh, develop some design specs to actually provide practical advice to community housing providers and to social housing providers around what would work. Um, the other thing I'm pleased to say is we've worked with Bridge Housing who have actually designated uh, specific properties in their portfolio for older women which is really great to see and so they're, they're in the process of housing around 10 women in one of their new properties um, to provide a affordable housing as well. Um, the other work that we've been doing is around the um, private rental market and um, the issues uh, around insecurity of tenure. Um, the Residential Tenancies Act has recently be been reviewed and unfortunately uh, one of the key things that we were advocating for which was security of tenure, particularly for older people, um, has not been taken up but we will continue to be advocating around the need for people to have secure tenancy so they're not, if they are in the private rental system, they're not constantly having to worry about having to move or being evicted as well. Um, and then the other thing we'd also uh, been working on looking at is, is precisely, uh, again, what Michelle raised, which is around there are very few services specifically for older women, very few homelessness services specifically for older women, and the system itself is not um, targeted to work with this client group. So what we've been trying to do within the specialist homelessness sector is to really work around what would, how would we actually appropriately support older women. As, be, as has been mentioned, it's not necessarily, uh, there's not a high level of support that people need, but they do need to be able to feel comfortable and um, feel that they can access services and receive the support that they may need. Um, so we're working around that uh, issue as well. Um, and then the other issue too, which has also been raised, is around um, the the priority housing list and how you and the social housing list and the waiting list. And there is 60,000 plus people on the New South Wales um, waiting list, and it is based on uh, priority housing need. And so we've been talking with the minister and with housing again around if you are just poor and you don't have complex needs, then can we look at how what what, what options and what can be provided? Because as Susan identified rightly. People who may not have needs at this point, but if they don't get housed, then they will have complex needs, and so we're just creating more, you know, situations that shouldn't be allowed. Um, and then the final thing we're really looking at is, again, securing the financial independence for older women. We've been working, um, we put a submission into the estimates, uh, the, sorry, the, the review done by the Senate on um, economic independence for women, and talked about homelessness and the links between housing and, ec and economic independence as well. So those are the kinds of action things that we're doing. Um, and uh, Homelessness New South Wales, as I mentioned, as a peak homelessness organisation, is also working very actively in the affordable housing space. And, and whenever we talk about affordable housing or homelessness, we also always make sure that we try and raise older women as an issue as well. And so we're really hoping to continue to, um, to progress some practical things whilst we continue to advocate as well. And I guess the, the, the success has been that since the launch of the plan, 
there has been a lot of media around older women and the issue of older women and homelessness and there's been lots and lots of events that have been picked up, picking up on the issue as well. So it's really pleasing to see this kind of final move. I mean, it's a bit late really given the ageing uh, aging population that we have and the, and the increase in need we're experiencing, but at least it's good to see that it's really being taken seriously now. Thank you.